Welcome to this symposia spotlight on synovial sarcoma. Where are we now? Where next? This symposia has been presented as part of the Connective Tissue Oncology Society Annual Meeting 2021. Just a reminder to all who are attending that the meeting is being recorded. We hope that the material being presented will generate a lot of questions. To submit questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. This is our agenda for today. My name is Sandra McGuigan. I am the VP of Medical Affairs at Adapt Immune, and I'm going to serve as the moderator. We are very pleased and honored to have three distinguished speakers as part of the symposium. Our first speaker is Dr. Che Jaskumar Patel, who will give us an overview on synovial sarcoma and some of the novel approaches to its management. Dr. Patel is a tenured professor of medicine and holds the Robert Herring Distinguished Professorship in Cancer Research. He is also the medical director of the Sarcoma Center at the University of Texas, MD Anderson. Dr. Patel has authored numerous book chapters and articles in various journals and has been section editor for the sarcoma section of current oncology reports since 2000. His clinical research interests include systemic therapy for sarcomas, GIS, and other tumors originating in bone and soft tissues. He is a past president of CITOS, past member of the executive committee and chair of the clinical research committee of SARC and has served as the past program chair for CITOS and the sarcoma track for ASCO. He's currently a member of the board of directors and chair of the medical advisory board for the Condroma Foundation. Following Dr. Patel presentation, we have Dr. Luis Hidalgo, who will review some important immunological concepts for oncologists and introduce the reasons why HLA is important in the tumor microenvironment. Dr. Hidalgo is the medical director of the HLA laboratory at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery. His interest in science began as a biochemist before turning to transplantation immunology in 1998. Since that time, he has thought to understand the mechanisms by which a recipient's immune system destroys a donor organ. His research interests include the immunogenicity of HLA mismatches leading to the generation of anti-HLA antibodies anti-HLA antibody assessment methods, and immune effector mechanisms of allograft rejection. Dr. Hidalgo has more than 50 peer review publication and is an active member of the American Society of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics and the American Society of Transplantation. We will round out the formal symposium presentations with a presentation by Dr. Krishna Komanduri. Dr. Komanduri will guide us through what has been learned with CAR T cell therapy and how it may translate to the treatment of solid tumors with adopted cell therapy. Dr. Komanduri is the chief of the division of transplantation and cellular therapy at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Miami and holds the Kalish family share in stem cell transplantation and serves as the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Clinical Innovation at Sylvester. He's a professor of medicine, microbiology and immunology and a physician scientist with a laboratory focus in T-cell immunology in cancer. Dr. Komanduri has served as the president of the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy in 2017, has served on the board of directors of the Foundation for Accreditation of Cellular Therapy. He is a current member of the board of directors 
and the Compensation Committee for the National Marrow Donor Program. And since 2016, he has been a member of the MIT New Digest Focus Financing of Curative Therapies in the United States, think tank developing finance solution to curative gene and cell therapies. In 2021, Dr. Komanduri was inducted into the Henry Kunkel Society as well as into the second class of named fellows of the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. Finally, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers for the full panel during a live session. Thank you very much for your interest in this symposia. At this time, I will turn the presentation over Dr. Patel. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Sandra, and thank you to the audience for joining us for this educational symposium as part of CTOS. The topic for discussion is going to be synovial sarcoma. I'm going to set the stage up with some historical perspective and what we have known about this disease, transitioning then into what is new and exciting happening in the therapeutic arena. Here are my disclosures on this slide. And moving on to what we have known about synovial sarcoma. This is a classic example where the name given to the sarcoma does not necessarily imply the tissue of origin. In majority of the cases, probably 98 plus percent of them, synovial sarcoma has nothing to do with synovium or the joint space itself. Histologically, this is a monomorphic spindle cell tumor with some variable epithelial differentiation. Three known variants have been described. One is called monophasic synovial sarcoma, where the tissue is mostly composed of spindle cell or mesenchymal component. There is a biphasic component, which does have some spindle cell mesenchymal component, but also shows epithelial or glandular component besides it. This is the description that classically describes a synovium and therefore the term synovial sarcoma. And then finally, there can be a poorly differentiated variant where the characteristics of epithelial and mesenchymal differentiation get lost and it just looks like a very undifferentiated sarcoma. Pathologically and interestingly enough radiographically, about a third of the synovial sarcomas will show some calcification or ossification. Classically, this happens to be the speckled type of calcification as opposed to large chunks of amorphous calcification that is far more characteristic of a abdominal retroperitoneal well-differentiated, de-differentiated liposarcoma. From a genetic standpoint, this tumor is characterized by a pathognomonic translocation between chromosomes X and 18, where the SS18 gene then partners with either SSX1, 2, or 4, resulting in the fusion transcript that drives oncogenesis. The mechanistic aspects of how this fusion transcript drives oncogenesis have come to light in more recent years. It appears to incorporate itself into the chromatin remodeling complex, the SWI SNF or BATH complex, and dysregulates the function of, the, uh, of, of this subunit. Immunohistochemically, there are few characteristics that also help define this tumor. Majority of these tumors will express diffuse expression of BCL2. 60% will show presence of CD99. Strong and diffuse nuclear staining for TLE1 is also found more commonly. And more apropos to the newer developments in this area is now the documented strong expression of cancer testis antigen, NYSO1. Here is a clinical presentation. These happen to be very rare tumors comprising of only about five to 10% of all soft tissue sarcomas resulting in an annual incidence of approximately a thousand patients in the US or Europe. This is also a tumor that affects various different age groups, but interestingly enough, the mean age happens to be under 40 years and the population adult, uh, young adults, adolescent and young adults are also affected by this particular tumor. There is no predilection for gender. And most commonly this will present as a soft tissue mass, predominantly in the lower extremities, predominantly around the knee joint. And the clinical manifestations are going to be variable based on the actual location and the size of the tumor. 
From a prognostic standpoint, the classic prognostic factors for soft tissue sarcoma do apply here. Uh, tumor size and grade are the two most important prognostic factors. There is a thought process amongst the pathology community that majority of the synovial sarcomas by definition tend to be high grade then resulting in size and location being the most important other prognostic factors. Outcomes, therefore, will then be associated with these prognostic factors with the knowledge that larger tumors that are greater than five centimeters in size are associated with poor outcome. And there's some evidence that tumors in the trunk have a poorer survival compared to the more common subset of extremity location. In some series where there is long-term follow-up, I think these prognostic factors reflect themselves in the frequency of either local recurrence or metastases. And just under 50% of these patients with this diagnosis can develop a local recurrence or metastases clearly related to the prognostic factors that we have talked about. In terms of metastatic pattern, an interesting feature of synovial sarcoma, unlike the more common soft tissue sarcomas like leiomyosarcomas, liposarcomas, or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas, is the predilection for involvement of lymph nodes. If you look at the entire soft tissue sarcoma subset, the incidence of lymph node metastases is generally less than 5%. There are some histologies, and synovial sarcoma being one of the few, where the incidence of lymph node involvement can approach 20%. So paying attention to the regional nodal basin becomes very critical. And in the context of the newer revised AJCC staging system where N1 disease is classified as metastatic disease, this obviously has some implications. And in series that have long-term follow-up, as you can see, the five, 10 and 15 year survivals unfortunately do show some drifting down. I think the clinically relevant translation of this is that long-term follow-up is important. There can be a subset of these patients who may develop late recurrences because of the obvious clinical scenarios. From a standard of care therapy standpoint, surgical resection remains the standard of care for patients with localized synovial sarcoma. Consideration for neoadjuvant and adjuvant radiation therapy is frequently given to improve local control. And consideration for neoadjuvant and adjuvant systemic therapy, while an area of continued debate, may be less so for a subset like synovial sarcoma, where the patient population is young and healthy. The tumor does tend to be responsive to the standard chemotherapy drugs. And the prognosis, as we have outlined, can be bad in many of these patients. So there is a sizable population of these patients that may well be subjected to neoadjuvant and adjuvant systemic chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgical resection. For patients with metastatic disease, uh, the frontline therapy, as you will see on the next slide, uh, is fairly well defined. There may be slight variations, but there isn't any major differences of opinions. I think the problem arises in second line or later therapies where the limited efficacy of response rates of less than 15% make it very difficult to make dogmatic recommendations. What you see on this slide is distribution on the left-hand panel of first line treatments, uh, ifosfamide, may well be the single most active drug chemotherapeutic agent uh, for synovial sarcomas. Doxorubicin obviously is the generally accepted standard of care. And so if you look at the consensus within first line therapy, it's either doxorubicin or ifosfamide based regimens or frequently combinations of doxorubicin and ifosfamide. Instances where other regimens are used, these may be directed by patient and host factors that may preclude the use of toxic anthracycline or ifosfamide-based therapies. On the right-hand panel, you see second-line treatments. And for those who have not had anthracycline, ifosfamide clearly becomes a reasonable, appropriate second-line agent. By default, the second line therapy in other soft tissue sarcomas that happens to be gemcitabine and docetaxel has percolated into this area, 
although there is evidence that there is very limited efficacy of gemcitabine and docetaxel in synovial sarcomas. And you then have approved agents like pazopanib uh, that does have activity in synovial sarcomas, trebectidin, there is experience in Europe suggesting activity, and so on and so forth. What about the overall natural history of the disease, right? So for patients with metastatic disease, uh, not unexpectedly, the time to next treatment and the median overall survivals keep trickling down as one progresses, as a patient progresses through subsequent lines of treatment, acknowledging that the efficacy of the therapies available is, a diminishing, is of diminishing return. Uh, and the prognosis of that patient also continues to get worse, where by the time the patient gets into third and fourth line therapy, there is a very, very poor median time to next treatment and a median overall survival. So this sets the stage up for the unmet need, if you will, for newer ways of treating this disease. And Immunotherapeutic approaches, as this audience knows very well, have been very popular in malignancies in general. Uh, and this is clearly applicable to the soft tissue sarcoma space. Several different platforms have been in investigation, resulting in several different modalities listed up here, addressing all these targets listed here in the right-hand column. Pertinent to our conversation of synovial sarcoma, I think is the fact that there is expression of the cancer testis antigens NYESO and MAGE. And this has sparked, if you will, the interest primarily in TCR T cell adoptive cellular therapies. From an adoptive T cell therapy, as all of you are quite aware, there are two major approaches. The antibody-based approach to cell surface antigens has been fairly successful in the hematologic malignancies, for example, the CD20 positive lymphomas, where generation of CAR T cells, CAR NK cells have been successful in terms of therapy and outcomes for this patient population. Unfortunately, this is not a strategy that applies to majority of the solid tumors, primarily because of the lack of presence of surface antigens that can be targeted. So the way we can try to capitalize the same approach, if you will, in, in solid tumors is to sort of go back to TCR-based recognition of the HLA type and direct these T cells to the cancer testis antigens that selectively are expressed on tumor and not so much on the normal tissues. And this therefore has been the approach that has been far more rewarding, popular, and there is clearly early evidence of proof of principal activity in solid tumors of various types. Taking a closer look at this adoptive T cell therapies, NYESO1 and or MAGE A4 uh, are observed in more than 50% of synovial sarcoma specimens. Varying degrees of NYESO1 and or MAGE A4 expression can also be documented and seen in a variety of other bone and soft tissue sarcoma histologies listed up here. So the strategy in general has been to take the autologous CD4, CD8 T cells, genetically modify them to express a high affinity T cell receptor to then recognize the tumor cell. A FAMI cell capitalizes on MAGE A4, when it is bound to HLA-AO2, and let a cell capitalizes on the NYESO1 positivity when it is bound to HLA-AO2. These TCRT cell therapies do indeed require double testing. There has to be high resolution HLA typing first. If the HLA subtype is the appropriate one of HLA-AO2, then the second test, which is immunohistochemical staining for the presence and the degree of positivity for cancer testis antigens like NYESO1 and MAGE-A4 would be the next step. This whole philosophy has been tested in clinical trials as many of you in the audience may well have participated on some of these trials. So SPEARHEAD-1 is a clinical trial that tested a FAMI cell HLA typing and MAGE-A4 staining documentation was performed in the screening phase. 
baseline tumor measurements were obtained and study enrollment was, was performed. Lymphodepletion happens on days minus seven to minus four. This is then followed by the famicell infusion on day one. And we'll show you some data on how long these cells persist in the circulation. And as is true for most immunotherapies in general, even going back to the old age of interferon and IL-2, uh, long-term follow-up and long-term benefit is a very critical aspect of these types of treatments. The medians, time to progression, overall survival, while very important and relevant, I think in my personal opinion, the tail to the curve is that a possibility of a small fraction that could potentially be cured is of most interest. Approximately 90 patients are planned to be treated on the SPEARHEAD-1 trial. Cohort 1 comprises of 45 patients, and Cohort 2 will comprise of the other 45 patients. A famicell in this trial was administered to fairly heavily pretreated patients across a wide range of MAGE A4 expression levels uh, and cellular doses. Of interest again for discussion is the sarcoma subset, where synovial sarcoma subset comprised of 32 patients, and there were five patients with myxoid round cell liposarcoma. The MAGE A4 expression is listed up here, and you can see some other patient dynamics and patient demographics. These were clearly bulky enough tumors, patients with good performance status with multiple prior lines of therapy, and the median cell dose that was given was 8.8 .8 times 10 to the ninth cells. The median age of the patient was typical for this type of tumor at 42 years. And then there was relatively even distribution of males and females. Here is a slide that summarizes adverse events seen in more than 10% of patients. I acknowledge this is a busy slide, uh, but to highlight some of the important aspects. Fever and cytokine release syndrome is one of the areas of concern and one of the more common toxicities that ends up being seen. Note that the severity of this toxicity greater than or equal to grade three happens relatively sparingly. We do need to monitor liver enzymes, liver functions, and bilirubin. And occasionally there will be side effects on the serosal membranes with some development of pleural effusion that might also contribute to some respiratory symptoms that tend to overlap with the cytokine release syndrome. The proof of principle or punchline data, if, if, if you allow me to, to use that phrase, is on our, here on this slide. Clearly there is proof of principle activity seen on this waterfall plot. You see two patients with synovial sarcoma who had a complete response, overall resist response rate with volumetric reduction of the tumor happened in approaching 40% of patients with synovial sarcoma and about a quarter of the patients with myxoid round cell liposarcoma. The disease control rate, if you will, was fairly decent uh, and fairly high. So my interpretation of this is that many patients see some clinical benefit. There is about a 40 plus percent patients, especially in synovial sarcoma, who see a resist partial response. And then there is the opportunity or the possibility of a complete response that we know from historical data that this may have an impact on median overall survivals. Looking at the peripheral detection of a famicell and its persistence over a period of time, this is not unexpectedly dependent on the number of cells that can be infused. If less than 7 billion cells were infused, you see in the left-hand panel that the presence of the cells was approaching about 200 days. Although when the aliquots that could be infused were larger, you did see longer-term persistence hoping again for the point I was trying to make earlier about long-term benefit uh, in comparison to the conventional therapies that we use in the clinic. Leticell is the other type of treatment that has been predominantly tested again in myxoid round cell liposarcomas with very few patients with synovial sarcoma. The overall schema appears to be the same. The major difference is that this is directed at the NYE SO1 cancer testis antigen as opposed to MAGE A4. So again, patients go through the HLA-02 testing. 
staining for NYU. So one leukophoresis happens, the CD3 uh, positive T cells have to be uh, expanded ex vivo, uh, and then patients undergo lymphodepletion therapy followed by infusion of the uh, T cell T cells. And then long-term follow-up is obviously very critical to follow the progress of the patient and the impact on tangible endpoints like progression-free and overall survival. Here is again the proof of principle response activity. This is RESIST 1.1 uh, criteria. And you can see on the left-hand panel in the waterfall plot that again, there is proof of principle activity. There are several patients with a good partial response, several who have had some reduction in the tumor volume, not quite making it to the partial response uh, definitions. And on the right-hand panel is again, the same situation where correlation between the persistence of lettuce cell to the response shows that the responders clearly had a longer term presence uh, of the drug as opposed to the non-responders. From a toxicity standpoint, again, a busy slide, but all patients in cohort two experienced greater than or equal to grade three treatment emergent cytopenias. So myelosuppression is fairly universal. The T-cell-related cytokine release syndrome was also present in the vast majority of patients. But fortunately, no lethal implications were seen. There was no grade five adverse events in cohort two, and grade four treatment emergent adverse events occurred in about nine patients where one was serious, uh, and a grade four T-cell infusion-related AE was seen in four patients with one of them being serious. So clearly an area that needs to be monitored very carefully, and appropriate measures need to be taken at the right time. So the master plan overall uh, is a master protocol to assess the safety and activity of lead cell in the HLA-AO2 subset of patients with synovial sarcoma or myxoid round cell sarcomas. The plan is to include some pediatric and AYA patient population. Two studies or sub-studies are planned, if you will. The plan is to treat 10 patients in the frontline setting with previously untreated patients. Substudy two is an expansion phase, if you will, where 70 patients are planned to be treated and they would have to have had at least one prior anthracycline-based therapy. And the study schema remains the same where lymphodepletion happens with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, followed by the infusion of lettuce cell and the primary endpoint for this study is overall response rate per assist version 1.1 performed by Central Independent Review. And then the secondary endpoints will include duration of response, disease control rate, PFS, safety, and pharmacokinetics. So in summary, I think what you may know and what you have heard is that there is a difference between the conventional therapies that we are used to giving in the clinics that would be generically called off-the-shelf therapies. Patient sees us in the clinic today, we determine the need for therapy, and then you can write the orders and hopefully assuming financial clearance and other issues line up, the treatment could be started almost immediately. With TCR adoptive therapy, we do have to plan ahead of time, right? There is a complexity to this with patient identification. The treatment initiation requires the ex vivo expansion of cells, shipment and processing, and then ready for infusion cells. So there is a time curve to this with several steps, as you can see on this serpiginous diagram. So pre planning. And thinking of this ahead of time in preparation for this therapy down the road can certainly cut back, if you will, on some of these issues. And my following two speakers are going to emphasize these aspects and the technical aspects of it even more. So to quickly summarize, synovial sarcomas tend to be aggressive. They are very rare and unique tumors. They can be clinically challenging in a otherwise young and productive group of patients. There is a unique immunological tumor microenvironment with the presence of cancer testis antigens that allows us to sort of test the adoptive cellular therapy strategies. Preliminary clinical data from a pharma cell and lettuce cell as we reviewed in heavily pretreated patients have shown fairly encouraging results. And I should point out that this is quite favorable compared to what we have seen with the currently available second and third line therapies. And so therefore, adoptive cellular therapy is an emerging new modality 
that does require patient education and clinicians communication across many modalities, but holds a fair bit of promise. With that, I'm going to stop my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm gonna hand the, the uh, podium over to Dr. Hidalgo, who's going to walk you through the HLA typing uh, process. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here today. The title of my lecture is Immunology for the Oncologist. Why is HLA important? And my disclosures are on this slide. Just a general outline for the lecture. Uh, what I'm hoping to cover is the, the generation of adaptive immune responses and specifically antigen recognition by T cells, including both the T cell receptors and HLA, immune evasion strategies of tumors, as well as opportunities for engineered T cell immunotherapies. Now, my apologies, but we're gonna start at the very basic level, just to make sure everybody is equal. We'll start with defining the immune system. So the cells of the immune system are broadly labeled as leukocytes, as highlighted here in the green rectangle. Includes many of the cell types that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And if we start breaking down those cells between what it makes up the innate immune system, and that's highlighted now in the red rectangle, uh, this includes cell types such as monocytes, neutrophils, uh, many of the granulocytes, follicular dendritic cells, as well as natural killer cells. And if we look at what's left of the rest of the leukocytes, we are really looking at the adaptive immune system now, which is focused primarily on the T cells, B cells, and the natural killer cells do kind of belong a little bit in the adaptive immune system as well as the innate uh, because they do have properties that uh, belong to both really. Now, if we look at the purpose of an immune system, innate immunity is in charge of mounting the initial immune response to an immunologic insult and therefore it does not require previous exposure. The main purpose of the innate immune system is to limit the spread of the insult as well as initiate and support adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, generates antigen-specific immune responses, which require priming and cell expansion. This requires the expression of receptors then capable of recognizing specific antigens found on T cells and B cells. On the T cells, we have the T cell receptors, and on the B cells, we have the B cell receptors respectively. And in order to allow for the recognition of the vast array of pathogenic determinants, we have to have a high degree of diversity in antigen recognition to recognize all these pathogens, right? Hence the TCR and the BCR. But we also need high polymorphisms in the antigen presenting molecules, which is the portion that HLA fulfills. So if we look at the antigen recognition receptors, the TCRs and BCRs, the specific pathogen recognition requires the expression of these receptors. And the BCR is highlighted here on the left. Is If you look at it, really, it's, it's a membrane-bound antibody molecule with a, a small uh, component uh, of cell signaling um, that is required to uh, activate the B cells. The T cell receptor, is on the right. And as you can see, the TCR does resemble basically one of the arms of the B cell receptor. It has the same architecture, but the signaling components are a little bit more complicated. The high degree of diversity required to allow for the recognition of all possible antigens relies on the genomic rearrangement of genes that are encoding the BCRs and the TCRs. So we could spend an entire lecture on this, uh, but we're not going to do that. Uh, simply to say that uh, there are various segments in the germline configuration of these receptors um, that are mixed and matched in a, in a genetic shuffle 
that lead to specific combinations and therefore specific uh, reactivities. The process is identical, whether we're looking at how the antigen recognition component of the B cell receptor or the T cell receptor are put together. Now the combined variability built into the different elements composing the TCRs and the BCRs uh, translates to very high levels of diversity. And that's highlighted on the table here on the right. You can see that uh, combining all of the possible segments that can be rearranged, um, as well as some additional diversities built into the process, we have immunoglobulins, which are the B cell receptors or uh, antibody, can have uh, in the range of about five times 10 to the 13 different possibilities. And surprisingly, Despite being a smaller complex, the TCR actually has much higher diversity than the BCR. And that is in the range of about 10 to the 18 different uh, combinations. So BCRs and TCRs bind to their cognate antigens differently. The BCR, which again is the, the antibody molecule, recognizes epitopes on the surface of antigens. So the epitopes have to be accessible to antibody binding. Now, epitopes are most commonly proteins, but can also be sugars, lipids, or even DNA. And this is capable of binding both soluble as well as membrane-associated antigens. The TCR is a little bit more complicated in a way because the epitopes that it recognizes are buried within the antigens. They actually are the peptides uh, that are, can be in the middle of the antigen. So it requires that these antigens be first broken down into peptide fragments uh, and then presented by the MHC or HLA molecule. Eventually, we end up this uh, antigen processing and antigen presentation step highlighted here on the right. So the role of HLA in immune responses is, uh, I've told you that there's a high degree of HLA polymorphism, and this works in tandem with the high TCR diversity. If we really simplify things quite a bit, uh, we can simply say that HLA proteins primarily perform one job, and their, their only job is really to present antigen to T cells in the form of a peptide HLA complex. And that's what's highlighted in uh, the figure here. We have the HLA molecule presenting a peptide, and then the peptide HLA complex is what is recognized by the T cell receptor. Following antigen recognition, T cells undergo multiple rounds of proliferation and differentiate into effector and memory T cells. So we have this initial step that uh, we just saw in the previous slide. This will trigger uh, a signaling cascade within the T cells, uh, and then the production of growth factors, uh, triggering massive cell expansion. So this single clone here will expand to generate a number of effector T cells. And for the context of this lecture, that our effector T cells are going to be cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So the effector T cells uh, will migrate into inflamed peripheral tissues as a way to eliminate the, the pathogen or the tumor that is triggering the immune response. A small number of memory cells are also generated, and these circulate through lymphoid organs as well as peripheral tissues. To, uh, for the purpose of immune surveillance. Now we have to remember that antigens can only be seen by T cells when they are presented on HLA molecules. So we're going to examine HLA antigens in a little bit more detail. There are two families of HLA antigens. We have the class one family uh, highlighted on the diagram on the left and class two highlighted on the right. 
First thing to note is that structurally, class one and class two are put together a little bit differently. Uh, class one is a monomeric molecule uh, with a second protein called beta-2 microglobulin um, that is associated with it for stability. Class two, on the other hand, is a heterodimer uh, made up of a, both an alpha and a beta chain. HLA class one is expressed on almost every nucleated cell in the body. Their main job is to present antigens to CD8 positive T cells, uh, which are also most commonly known as cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CTL. The expression of HLA class one varies between tissues. It tends to be very high uh, basal expression on lymphocytes and fairly low on non-immune cells, but is highly inducible. HLA class two, on the other hand, has a much more restricted expression. It is primarily expressed only on professional antigen presenting cells, which include cells such as B cells, uh, monocytes or macrophages, and dendritic cells. HLA class two molecules present antigens to CD4 positive T cells, which are also more commonly known as T helper cells. The pattern of uh, expression is much more restrictive, but it is still inducible on certain non-immune cells, primarily epithelial cells and endothelial cells. So if we look at the job for HLA class one molecules, HLA class one molecules present peptides derived from endogenous antigens and allow for immune surveillance against viruses and cancers. So if we start with an endogenous antigen um, coming into the cell, this will go into, uh, it'll be processed by the proteasome, which is really uh, like an intracellular blender. It will digest the antigen into smaller bits. Um, so these peptides then are loaded into the endoplasmic reticulum, which is where the class one HLA molecule is, uh, is kept. The peptides will be loaded onto HLA and the HLA peptide complex then is transported to the, the cell membrane. So this is known as the, the endogenous pathway of antigen presentation. So in order to accommodate the complexity of the antigenic peptides presented and be able to be antigen specific, the T cell TCR uses its most polymorphic region, which is a, a, a region called um, CDR3, which stands for complementary determining region three, to directly recognize the peptide being presented. So this is a view, a side view of the interaction between the T cell with the T cell receptor highlighted in blue and the antigen presenting cell uh, with the HLA molecule highlighted in red, the peptide here is in green. And if we rotate this, uh, the view of this complex so that we're looking down on it from the TCR, you can see that um, here are the two chains of the T cell receptor. Here's CDR3, the most polymorphic region of the T cell receptor. And you can see that it directly engages the peptide with minimal uh, interactions with the structural segments of the HLA molecule. So I told you that HLA polymorphism is, is very high and it is not randomly placed within the HLA molecule. The HLA polymorphisms are primarily found in the amino acids around the peptide binding grooves. As you can see on the diagram here on the right, the colored amino acids are the ones that are the polymorphic regions with a HLA class one. And you can see that they're arranged so as to uh, affect the peptide that is being presented. So HLA polymorphism determines how well a specific pathogen will be recognized by the immune system. The ability to present the ideal peptide dictates the efficiency of the immune response. 
So you require then the right HLA type in combination with the right TCR to generate the best immune response. Here are some numbers just to give you an idea as to the degree of HLA polymorphism. HLA genes are the most polymorphic genes in the whole human genome. And so far, uh, we have characterized at least 11,000 different HLA class one proteins that are encoded. This, uh, this graph here on the bottom shows you the number of polymorphic proteins uh, across the different HLA class one loci. So you can see that the bulk of the polymorphism is, resides within what we call the classic uh, HLA molecule, which includes HLA loci's A, B, and C. Uh, B is the, the most polymorphic, followed by A and followed closely by C. HLAs E and F and G, uh, are, these are non-classical HLA molecules with obviously a much more limited degree of polymorphism. When we look at polymorphism, again, we're, we're simply focused primarily on HLA class one. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on HLA class two uh, simply because of the, uh, the, primary, the primary role that HLA class one has in, uh, in re the recognition of tumors. So looking at the different HLA alleles, um, we can see that by um, preferentially presenting different peptides from the same protein, um, the way this is done is by um, specific polymorphisms at uh, these anchor residues, um, which is what grabs the peptide within the peptide binding groove. The peptide preference is dictated by the specific amino acids uh, encoded in these anchor residues, uh, particularly in positions B and positions F, um, which are highlighted here with the green arrows. So you can see that different HLA types um, will preferentially grab peptides with different amino acid sequences um, at these uh, two different residues. So just to give us an idea as to then how this would play out, um, we have a, a visual representation here of the impact of HLA polymorphism on peptide presentation. So in this example, we're going to look at potentially what would happen in individuals with a, an HLA A typing of O201. So people who are HLA O201 would preferentially present the following peptide derived from, um, from this uh, viral protein X. Right, so viral protein X has this amino acid sequence. It will be processed by the proteasome um, and processed. And the preferential peptide that will be loaded on HLA A0201 will look something like this. However, if we look at a slightly different allele of HLA02, which would be HLA0203, the same other protein will be processed, but a slightly different peptide will be presented, right? So now the, the amino acid sequence is gonna be different. And depending on um, which TCR is recognizing these viral peptides in the context of their HLA molecules, this will drive the, uh, the efficiency of the immune response. So if HLA AO201 presenting this particular peptide is the ideal peptide to be presented, you will have a very robust T cell response with the generation of a large number of effector T cells. Whereas the peptide presented by HLA AO203 will generate an immune response, but it just won't be quite as robust as what we see with AO201. So for this reason, is why knowing the exact allele of the HLA type is particularly important. Now, the TCR um, has varying uh, affinities um, for peptide HLA complexes, right? So that's why I keep saying that um, it's, it, it's the combination of the right HLA molecule presenting the right peptide combined with the right TCR to recognize that complex. 
So overall, T cell receptors, um, as far as their affinities for HLA and peptide go, um, are on the lower end of the spectrum for overall affinities, but their affinities can vary quite a bit. And it is really spread out um, over, um, over three logs difference. In comparison to, for example, antibody molecules, which tend to have um, overall higher affinities, uh, and they also have a widespread um, of, uh, of affinities. And then finally, growth factor receptors are, are very high affinity receptors in this case. Now, given the low affinity that most naturally occurring TCRs will have for a peptide HLA complex, TCR engagement then often requires uh, high degrees of HLA expression so that you can start uh, relying on avidity uh, and not solely on affinity. This is also combined with supplementary co-receptors and adhesion molecules, which are highlighted on the figure here on the right. So molecules such as uh, LFA1 uh, expressed on the T cells uh, and CD2 uh, we will help to strengthen um, the overall affinity for antigen recognition. So the way this plays out is that when amino acids making up the, the peptide recognition portion of the TCR may not ideally fit the peptide that's being presented on the HLA complex, you will have uh, generally a weaker TCR affinity. So we'll put our affinity um, where this red arrow is on the spectrum of a TCR affinities, right? And the reason for this is that, um, as you can see from, from this, um, this diagram uh, that we're gonna use as an example, is simply that the, the right amino acids are not perfect um, in recognizing this peptide, right? So you can see that the shapes are not quite matching uh, either in this position or this position uh, and sometimes the, um, the proper uh, amino acid is maybe not ideal on the HLA side either, right? So overall then, um, when you have this degree of uh, less than ideal um, amino acids recognizing and grabbing onto the peptide, you will have generally lower degrees of affinity. Now, when you have an ideal uh, TCR affinity for HLA peptide complex. Um, this is when we have the peptides fitting perfectly onto the HLA complex and we have the ideal recognition from the TCR. Um, and that's what's highlighted on the diagram now. So you can see that uh, each of these peptides is, is being uh, perfectly recognized um, both on the HLA molecule. So it is, uh, it's able to preferentially present this peptide um, as well as the TCR, which will have very high affinity for this particular HLA peptide complex, right? So it will put us near the top end of the uh, affinities that are um, available to a T cell receptor. So this is seeing how HLA class one really um, plays such a strong role in how well uh, a particular pathogen or tumor will be recognized by the immune system, it makes sense that this pathway would be targeted uh, by, by both uh, viruses as well as uh, cancer uh, as an immune evasion strategy. And this is, this is very commonly done. Um, very many tumors um, and viral infections um, lead to the downregulation of HLA class one expression. Right, makes sense. You decrease HLA class one expression, then you also decrease the chances of being detected by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So, right, so in a normal cell, um, you tend to have uh, fairly high levels of uh, HLA class one, particularly if you're if you're existing in an inflamed environment, um, and this will allow for TCR avidity. Uh, to compensate for the, um, the chance of a low affinity interaction, uh, which is common to most naturally occurring TCRs. In a tumor cell though, you often have suppression of HLA class one expression as a way to effectively neutralize most CTL with naturally occurring TCRs, 
uh, that may be specific for the tumor-derived peptides being presented on HLA class one. So luckily the immune system uh, recognizes the, uh, the vulnerability here um, and does have a process in place to, uh, to prevent this, uh, this pathway from being exploited. Natural killer cells exist to mitigate this HLA class one downregulation. NK cell activation, which often leads to target cell death, is something that is carefully regulated and depends on a balance of positive and negative signals. For example, um, as you can see here, so when an NK cell will uh, bind onto a target, um, if there's a balance of positive and negative signals, then there will be, there's, there's no effect. The negative signals that uh, NK cells are given come from a set of inhibitory receptors. Um, and many of these inhibitory receptors, which include uh, inhibitory uh, killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors, um, NKG2A in complex with CD94 and others, um, many of these have HLA class one molecules as their inhibitory ligands, right? So HLA class one is something that is closely monitored uh, by NK cells. So when you have a loss of HLA class one expression on a target cell, you're really removing the ligand to engage these inhibitory receptors. And this then shifts the signal balance to activation. This is a, a process that's called missing self. Um, and it then makes the NK cell uh, the go-to countermeasure to guard against immune evasion uh, by both viruses and tumors uh, against HLA class one downregulation. Now, not, no system is perfect, of course. So despite the, the missing self countermeasure by NK cells, Many tumors still escape immune surveillance by downregulating HLA class one just enough to minimize CTL detection, but not enough to trigger NK cell cytotoxicity. Right, so you can see that um, you know when you plot it against uh, a graph uh, representing HLA class one expression with negative being on the left uh, and very high expression being on the right. If you are presenting uh, a pathogenic set of peptides, having high HLA class one expression will uh, lead to CTL mediated cytotoxicity, right? So a virus or a tumor then will opt to downregulate and perhaps eliminate class one, that will trigger NK cell mediated cytotoxicity. But if you downregulate um, to this lower range where you know, you're making it really hard for most TCRs on the CTLs to recognize you, uh, but not enough to really trigger um, missing self recognition by the NK cells, then you're probably in a happy medium right around here. And that's probably the, the best place to, to avoid immune surveillance overall. So once you downregulate HLA class one, you're really removing avidity as a factor that's contributing to support the TCR HLA engagement. Right, but this then opens the opportunity for um, you know engineering T cell therapies um, using the T cell receptors. If we could identify HLA class one types capable of presenting immunodominant tumor derived peptides, we can then engineer the TCR sequence to obtain the highest affinity TCR HLA combination that we can get. Right, and just to remind you, this is going to be on average about two logs higher affinity than what most of the naturally occurring TCRs um, tend to be. Right, so it'll put us right at the very, uh, at the highest end um, of the affinity capable for T cell receptors. Um, and that will require specific engineering. And the need for this is that um, although current cellular therapies have largely focused on the introduction of chimeric antigen receptors or CARs uh, into patients' T cells, this, I mean, this is a great type of immunotherapy. Um, and of course the, the results from these um, are, are very impressive. 
it is limited in its application to tumor types that display cell surface antigens that can be targeted by the CARs, right? But the problem is that many tumors may not display cell surface antigens that can differentiate them from normal cells. However, every tumor will have uh, at least a handful of intracellular tumor antigens, and these will be mutated cell proteins, and these are the ones that can be targeted using um, engineered T cell receptors. So that's basically what I wanted to, uh, to cover with that. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and, and just try to get a, just a small glimpse at least as to how we tackle um, HLA typing to, uh, to recognize the specific um, HLA allele, right? So HLA typing is uh, something that's commonly done uh, by any HLA laboratory. Uh, it is performed to determine whether a, a patient expresses the right HLA allele that in, in our case will be able to present the correct peptide uh, recognized by uh, an engineer TCR, for example. The current gold standard for this is a molecular HLA typing method that is called next generation sequencing. Now, next generation sequencing is something that will be available at most HLA laboratories um, and certainly all HLA laboratories existing at academic institutions. Um, over time, I think this will be a technology that will be available at all HLA laboratories. Now, engineer TCRs tend to be designed primarily to recognize HLA-A0201. And, and the reason for this is that it is by far the most common HLA type across most races. As we can see from the table underneath, we have the five most common uh, HLA-A typings listed uh, on the column here on the left. And you can see the, the frequencies across the different uh, ethnic groups here. So you can see that AO201 is the top ranked allele uh, in both uh, people of European descent, uh, African-American descent, uh, and Hispanic uh, descent. Uh, maybe not though for um, Asia and, uh, and Pacific Islands. And if you look at the overall frequencies, we can see that AO201 makes up almost 30% uh, of uh, Caucasians, um, approximately 12.5% of African Americans, just under 10% uh, of Asians, and uh, just under 20% of Hispanics. And when you compare it to the next most common HLA type, which is AO101, uh, you can see that you take a big hit in the overall frequency, going from uh, almost 30% down to 17% in Caucasians, uh, going from 12% to, uh, to almost 5% in African-Americans, um, going from 9.5% to 5 uh, and going down from 19.4% to 67 in Hispanics. So for this reason, I think, um, you know, the concept of engineering TCRs uh, will by default always start with the recognition of AO201 molecules um, as this is the, the first stage uh, for all um, to, to ensure that we have the broadest uh, application of this therapy. And that's really all I wanted to cover for today. It's been my pleasure to, uh, to give this lecture here. And I will, I believe the questions will be all handled um, at the end of this session. And I will now end my session and uh, I welcome you to please uh, help me to welcome Dr. Uh, Komanduri, uh, who will follow my lecture. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Krishna Komanduri, and I'm here to talk to you about developing T-cell therapies for solid tumors and lessons that we can learn from CAR T cell therapy. Here are my disclosures. So here we are in 2021, uh, and we're on the threshold of novel therapies, uh, including TCR transgenic therapies for solid tumors. But we have to remember that we have a number of prior examples of successful cancer immunotherapy. 
Uh, as a stem cell transplant doc, I'll remind all of you that the first real critically uh, successful way of using T cell therapies was with allogeneic hematopoietic trans transplantation for hematologic malignancies, which is curative and really relies on the effects of donor T cells to cure uh, relapsed and high risk lymphomas and leukemias uh, after hematopoietic transplantation. A number of other non curative therapies have been used, including high dose IL 2, type 1 interferons, BCG. And then we have a number of other therapies, including anti-tumor monoclonal antibodies, uh, T-cell vaccines, checkpoint therapies, and most recently, starting in 2017, the FDA approval of CAR T-cells, which we know can be curative uh, and can treat patients with either relapsed or high-risk diseases uh, and are now FDA approved for leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. And most of the rest of this talk will focus on lessons that we can derive from CAR T-cell therapies. It's critical to know that oncology leads in the number of ongoing cell and gene therapy and clinical trials. So there are a number of other disease categories where immunotherapies are being uh, developed, but the vast majority of therapies that are being developed for T cell therapies and, and other immunotherapies are in the field of oncology. And indeed, there are over 700 clinical trials right now uh, that are aiming for cures of diseases in this area. We have now a number of approved products, including most recently a BECMA, uh, which was approved for adults with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma, uh, and also uh, earlier this year, lysocaptogene marilusol, uh, 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 which was approved for adults with relapsed or refractory large B-cell lymphoma, joining two other T-cell therapies that, that focus on CD19, tisogen leclusol uh, and axicaptogene solulusol, also approved for relapsed and refractory large B-cell lymphoma. We also have brexicaptogene autolusol, which was approved last year. Uh, and this uh, was approved for relapsed or refractory mantle cell lymphoma, which is a similar product to axicaptogene solulusol, other than a, a peripheral isolation step prior to manufacturing. This slide illustrates that beyond CAR T cell therapies that can either be uh, unenriched or can uh, rely on a TCR knockout system, that there are a number of other T cell therapies that are in development for malignancies or other clinical problems. They include tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which can be isolated from the tumor microenvironment and expanded ex vivo, uh, lymphokine activated killer cells. We also use donor lymphocyte infusions, as we noted, after the relapse uh, of malignancies following hematopoietic transplantation. And there are now in a number of clinical trials virus-specific T cells that target antigens that are presented by viruses and can be associated with, with uh, malignancies. So these are all adoptive T cell therapies. Many of these T cell therapies, the ones on the left-hand side, don't involve genetic manipulation. So why are we interested in developing cellular therapies with T cell lymphocytes? First of all, T cells are uniquely positioned for fighting cancer. They have direct effector activity and helper function through the recruitment of other components of the immune response. And they have the capacity to expand ex vivo uh, and also in vivo uh, and establish a memory compartment, which is a major property for anti-tumor surveillance. So that is when T cells are present in the body uh, and, and can form and establish residence, if a tumor grows again, the T cells can then expand, uh, eliminating the, the tumor once it regrows. And the classes of, of T cells uh, that, that this includes, includes tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs, ex vivo expanded cytotoxic T cells or CTLs, T cell receptor modified T cells or TCR uh, Ts, or chimeric antigen receptor uh, modified T cells or CAR T cell therapies. So it's important to understand that CAR T cells, uh, which again constitute those five approved therapies that I talked to you about earlier, and TCR transgenic T cells are a bit different. The TCR transgenic T cell has a T cell receptor on it that is cloned uh, and inserted into the cell, but resembles the native human T cell receptor. And native human T cell receptors recognize in the context of HLA molecules, peptides that are presented in the HLA group. Importantly, these uh, peptides can come from any intracellular protein 
uh, from the cancer cell and therefore have a broad range of specificities that can be presented on cancer cells. Uh, and they can be uh, presented from any intracellular protein that goes through the proteasome and then is cycled through the Golgi apparatus to the cell surface on HLA molecules. CAR T cells, on the other hand, have uh, something that resembles a native T cell receptor, but it's been modified so that the external domain is really an antibody fragment. And this antibody recognition domain can only recognize surface proteins. So unlike TCR transgenic cells, which can really recognize any protein present in the cancer cell, the CAR T cell can only recognize a surface protein. And that's a major limitation of CAR T cell therapy. So there are a number of, of again, attributes of CAR T cells and TCR transgenic cells that are worth discovering. First of all, the target antigen for CAR T cells, as I noted in the previous slide, are really just surface proteins, which can be glycoproteins, glycolipids, or carbohydrates. While the TCR uh, transgenic T cells can recognize intracellular proteins presented on cell surface by MHC molecules, that is either uh, HLA class one or class two molecules. An advantage of CAR T cells is that the antigen recognition is MHC independent or HLA independent. That is, uh, you don't have to have a specific CAR T cell designed around the HLA type of the patient. Where for a TCR transgenic cell, there is a uh, uh, major histocompatibility antigen or HLA human lymphocyte uh, antigen dependence uh, on the CAR T cell. The receptor structure is also a bit different. We typically have single chain antibodies uh, that recognize the, 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 uh, the target surface antigen on the CAR T cell, where in the T cell uh, transgenic cell, there's an alpha beta heterodimer, which resembles a native T cell. The affinity for target, target is also different with CAR T cells typically recognizing targets in the nanomolar range and TCR transgenic cells recognizing targets in the micromolar range. But critically, CAR T cells require a much higher target density for response, typically more than 1,000 molecules per cell, where TCR transgenic cells can actually recognize a much smaller number of targets on a cell, uh, in fact, 1 to 50 molecules per cell, making them much more sensitive. So what about CAR T cell therapy for solid tumors? So far, there's been limited success in, uh, in the experimental models, and we have no FDA-approved CAR T cells for solid tumors. Because solid tumors have increased heterogeneity in the cancer antigens they express on their cell surface, and, and that results in less uh, detection of, dis of disease cells by CAR T cells and a less robust immune response. There's greater success using other types of adoptive T cell therapy, including affinity-enhanced T cell receptor transgenic cells. So these TCR T cells recognize internally derived cancer antigens complex with MHC molecules. Thus, the heterogeneity in the surface antigens does not impair the detection of these disease cells. So as I noted, CAR T cells again have an antibody that recognizes surface proteins where these TCRs, uh, uh, transgenic cells, can, uh, can recognize intracellular derived peptide uh, molecules on the HLA and are far more sensitive and can recognize a much broader uh, number of cancer antigens. So tumor-associated antigens are recognized by the TCR when presented as peptides by the uh, major histocompatibility complex or human lymphocyte antigens, HLA. TCRs recognizing tumor-associated antigens have been cloned, including the TCRs recognizing MART1 and GP100. Another antigen, NYESO1, is expressed on the surface of 50% of cancers of common epithelial origin. So there are a number of targets that can be used to develop TCR transgenic therapies. TCR transduced cells are biologically active as demonstrated by cytokine secretion after co-culture with both MART1 peptide pulse cells and HLA A2 positive melanoma cell lines. So we know that these cells are functional following stimulation with the antigens that can be recognized on cancer cells. So what lessons can we uh, learn from CAR T cell therapy as we think about the treatment of solid tumors? First, there are a number of problems. Uh, both CAR T cells and TCR transgenics can have on-target, off-tumor effects. Uh, and, and that is, they can actually recognize 
uh, antigens that are also present on healthy cells. So because of this, we need to target specific cancer antigens. We'd like to target uh, antigens that are in the presence of cancer cells, but not in the presence of, of native cells that are healthy, that we don't want to have uh, uh, targeted with the T cells. We can optimize the interaction of CARs with cancer cells relative to non-malignant cells, and we can introduce the requirement for multiple antigens or the, the absence of a specific antigen, that is we can use logic-gated CARs and or limiting the spatial and temporal activity of CARs. So these are all strategies that can actually make a cell uh, react uh, in the context uh, of requirements that limit that off-target activity. Another major problem is that robust activation of the immune response can result in systemic release of toxic levels of cytokines. And that can be associated with a number of syndromes, including cytokine release syndrome or CRS, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, which can lead to bone marrow failure after CAR T cell therapy. Uh, we can also see macrophage activation syndrome, uh, which is associated with HLH and cytokine release syndrome and what we now call immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome or ICANS. So what can we do? Because all of these, these, uh, these inflammatory syndromes are associated with T cell expansion in the context of target recognition. Well, all of these have led to the development of clinical management and the development of treatment guidelines that I'll discuss later in this talk. We also know that optimizing cell manufacturing or cell doses can limit these toxicities. And finally, we can modify construct design and use co-stimulatory domains or addition of inducible off switches to, again, make sure that the targets are, are recognized and activate T cells only when we want them to be. So there are a number of lessons also that we can learn about efficacy. So in some cases, there's a limited capacity to initiate the immune response due to insufficient CAR T cell activation. So to do that, we can add co-stimulatory domains and indeed the Second generation CAR molecules that are approved now have either a CD28 or 401BB co-stimulatory domain. We can worry about the presence or appearance of antigen negative cells, that is target downregulation and intrinsic characteristics of the effector cells uh, limiting the function and efficacy. Uh, and, and through that, uh, the, one of the, the ways that we can avoid that is to target alternate or multiple antigens. We know that persistence in the host is critical for durable clinical benefit, at least uh, in some cases. Uh, and by engineering naive and central memory cell subsets, we can uh, have cells that are likely to survive longer uh, as memory cells after transfer. And finally, we know that T cells need to penetrate solid tumors and endure the tumor microenvironment, which can be immunosuppressive. Uh, and we know that to overcome this, we could theoretically improve trafficking of T cells to the tumor site by uh, introducing chemokine receptors, for example, CXCR2 or CCR2B uh, into, into these cells. These are largely things that have been done, again, in preclinical models and not yet in human systems. In clinical practice, we know that depleted or dysfunctional T cells due to the disease itself or prior chemotherapy can lead to insufficient or defective apheresis material that can uh, cause a production failure. Uh, one way around this is to use HLA-matched donor cells or use off-the-shelf uh, approaches. We know that patients with advanced disease may not have the time it takes to manufacture the genetically modified cells. And again, off the shelf manufacturing or improved or more rapid manufacturing processes can get around this. And finally, we know that clinics may not be equipped for adoptive T cell therapy. Uh, and uh, we know that we have to increase the awareness of T cell therapy and what is required so that these manufacturing capacities can be developed across systems. In the next portion of the talk, I wanna talk about some common toxicities of CAR T cell therapies that may apply to other immune effector cell therapies. And in discussing this, I wanna talk about the rationale for developing a novel new system for grading and reporting of, of the major toxicities of T cell therapies. So I wanna discuss here a hypothetical case of cytokine release syndrome that can happen after CAR T cell therapies. In this hypothetical case, a 30 year old male with acute lymphoid leukemia gets CD19 positive CAR T cells. He then develops a fever to 40 degrees Celsius and requires a low dose vasopressor for two days and then improves. In the early days of CAR T cell therapy, three competing scales for grading of, of cytokine release syndrome were developed. The lead criteria were developed um, by Trey Lee and colleagues at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, the group at the University of Pennsylvania had a separate scale 
And finally, the CTCAE also um, uh, uh, defined a different set of criteria for cytokine release syndrome. In this hypothetical case, uh, this would have been graded as grade two CRS by the LEAP criteria, grade three CRS by the PEN criteria, or grade four CRS by the CTCAE uh, version 4.03. So you can see as trials developed uh, using these different grading systems, you can imagine that individuals reading these trials would have a hard time understanding uh, that in one trial, it would have been graded as grade four and, and in the other graded just as grade two. Uh, and indeed, clinical trials and our aftermarket reporting uh, in the early days of CAR T-cell therapy use these different toxicity grading systems. So we recognized that harmonization of the grading scales was needed. And that led to the ASTCT deciding to convene experts to develop a harmonized grading and reporting system. So this led us to develop a uh, workshop uh, which had 50 or, uh, or so uh, individuals who are experts in CAR T cell therapy from across the country. Uh, and we met in Washington, DC uh, uh, in June of 2018. And that led to the formulation of the ASTCT consensus grading system for cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicity associated with immune effector cells. The charge to consensus conference participants was the following. First, to develop consensus definitions for cytokine release syndrome and CAR T cell associated neurotoxicity. Secondly, to develop a consensus grading system of CRS and, CR and CAR T cell associated neurotoxicity. Critically, we wanted these results to be number one, applicable for both clinical trials and commercial use. Number two, clinically based on what the clinician observes and what is done about it, as opposed to, for example, laboratory based measurements. Number three, uh, it was very important for these to be applicable at the bedside by any provider, not just physicians, but any nurse or, um, or, or even uh, a nursing assistant should be able to easily uh, document the, the, you know, the elements of the grading system so that uh, we could centrally uh, uh, recognize a different grading system. And we wanted this to be easily verifiable in chart review, for example, by a data manager or somebody involved in a quality management system. So we devised first an ASTCT consensus definition of CRS, and we define this as a superphysiologic response following the activation or engagement of T cells or other immune effector cells for therapeutic attempt. We recognize that these symptoms must include fever at the onset and may include hypotension, capillary leak, which can lead to hypoxia and end organ dysfunction, but the end organ dysfunction was not required for the diagnosis. We recognize that these symptoms must occur within a reasonable time frame to the therapy. And critically, CRS would not be defined by cytokine levels or laboratory tests, and that CRS could apply to any immune effector cell activating or engaging therapy, not just CAR T cells, but for example, TCR transgenic cells, as we're talking about here. As new immunotherapies, not related to T cells are developed, the definition might need to be altered. For example, we might need a slightly different definition if we were uh, applying this to natural killer cell or other therapies. So this is the consensus grading system for cytokine release syndrome. So you can see that, that grade one has fever alone without any hypotension or hypoxia. Grade two has fever, but uh, could re require intervention, for example, fluids, but not vasopressors. Uh, and in the hypoxia category, could require low flow uh, nasal cannula or blow by oxygen. In grade three, hypotension requires a vasopressor with or without vasopressin and or high flow nasal cannula, face mask, non-rebreather mask, or venturi mask. If a patient requires multiple vasopressors, they now have grade four uh, and or if they require positive pressure that is CPAP, BiPAP, uh, or uh, mechanical ventilation, they become grade four. So you can see that these are easily identifiable uh, and verifiable characteristics that define grade two, grade three, or grade four that can be seen by an external examiner looking at the chart, just looking at what happened with the patient. Similarly, we developed consensus grading system for immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome or neurotoxicity. There is a score that uh, is developed based on a questionnaire that's present in, in the manuscript. 
uh, called the ICE score. Uh, and uh, for grade one, the patient awakes spontaneously and has an ICE score that's high, that has few uh, mental status deficits. A lower ICE score or a depressed level of consciousness where the patient awakens to voice makes the patient grade two. For grade three, the patient awakens only to tactile stimulus or has any seizure activity or has, uh, by imaging, focal or local edema on neuroimaging. The presence of any one of these factors makes the patient grade four, stupor, coma, life-threatening, prolonged seizures, deep focal motor weakness such as hemiparesis or paraparesis, or diffuse cerebral edema uh, by uh, imaging. In the next part of, of, of this talk, I'd like to talk about lessons that we need to learn from CAR T-cell therapy that are applicable to novel uh, therapies, including TCR transgenic therapies. It's critical, of course, that we keep the patient at the center of all we do. Uh, but to keep the patient well, we use outpatient therapies, we use an emergency department when uh, emergency uh, or uh, acute changes happen. We obviously take care of patients in inpatient units, and we have a number of other components, including an IRB for clinical trials, um, uh, an ICU if a patient becomes critically ill, uh, an investigational or clinical pharmacy, and a number of, of obviously clinical providers, which include fellows, residents, as well as faculty members. And, and critically, even beyond this, we have cell collection or apheresis. Uh, in the context of a clinical trial, we may have clinical trial budgeting uh, or finances. Uh, in, in some cases, we have uh, global international medicine programs when a patient is referred from out of the country, social services and housing support, laboratory assessments, and cell manufacturing. So all of these things have to be present and, and coordinated well to provide optimal care for the patient who's at the center of this. A major problem right now, and we know this from CAR T-cell therapy, is that if you look at patients who are diagnosed with high-risk non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a, a, only a, a relatively modest subset are actually receiving the therapies according to the FDA label. For example, there are probably about 10,000 patients a year who have diagnosis of high-risk non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that map to the FDA definitions for the use of CAR T-cell therapies. And yet, if you look at the number of patients who are receiving CAR T-cell therapies, it's less than three to 5,000 patients a year. So why is it that these patients with high-risk high risk, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are not all receiving therapy? Well, some are not referred for therapy. Some don't have a product collected. In some cases, the CAR T cells have a problem with manufacturing uh, or there's disease progression before infusion. In some cases, early lethal toxicities occur. Uh, and in some cases, patients actually receive therapy but relapse afterward. So what we really wanna do for CAR T cell therapies, and I would argue for any uh, subsequent therapies, is to really maximize uh, the flow so that the patients who meet the diagnostic criteria are all uh, progressive uh, through this continuum so that they eventually are referred for therapy early, they all uh, receive a product that's collected, uh, they have successful manufacturing without lethal toxicities, uh, and they don't relapse. So we wanna turn this pyramid into a cylinder. Well, how do we do that? Again, we have to think about access to transplantation. We can look at issues of donor availability. Um, we can look at social factors, including uh, age, ethnicity, language, culture, uh, health literacy. Uh, we can look at provider issues, for example, biases that, that lead them to consider other therapies other than the T-cell therapy. Sometimes the healthcare systems are, are limited, for example, for patients who live in rural areas or may not have access to an academic cancer center. There may be yeah, economic issues, for example, with insurance. All of these, these, these factors, as noted by my colleague, Namit Majel here, uh, affect access to stem cell transplantation and also affect access to immune effector cell therapy, such as CAR T cell therapy. And all of these could uh, provide barriers to TCR transgenic therapies as well. So to address this, we have to think about these barriers to cell therapy as either appropriate, for example, if a patient is just too old or infirm to receive a therapy, or if their disease is too high risk to benefit. But when it comes to the inappropriate therapies, we have to think about whether these are modifiable or non-modifiable. If they're non-modifiable, can they be mitigated? For example, if somebody doesn't have uh, insurance and doesn't qualify for insurance, can we mitigate the, the issues that result from, from that lack of coverage? But for the modifiable barriers, we have to really think about what we can do. And the responsibility there 
uh, is not just uh, in, in the, the cell therapy treatment center, but by referring centers, again, the transplant centers or T-cell therapy centers, payers that, that govern the healthcare system as well as policymakers, and we want to empower patients to help to mitigate these barriers. So in summary, cancer immunotherapy is proven to be an effective and dependable approach to induce durable immune responses with survival benefit in several cancers. Two therapies, uh, one based on antibody therapy to block uh, immune inhibitory checkpoints and others on the genetic engineering of T-cell therapies have resulted dramatic clinical results in recent years. So both uh, checkpoint inhibitors as well as T-cell therapies have yielded cures for patients who had no other options previously. Chimeric antigen receptors have established themselves as a powerful means to redirect and enhance the natural properties of both CD4 and CD8 T cells in hematologic malignancies, right now, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. But we also have a strong scientific rationale for the use of TCR transgenic therapies in solid tumors, and the preliminary results are encouraging across some specific tumors, including synovial sarcoma, MRCLS, ovarian, head and neck, melanoma, et cetera. These therapies are associated with unique toxicities of cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicities, and early recognition and proper management are needed to ensure patient safety. As with CAR T cells, interprofessional teams and interdisciplinary teams are needed to successfully deliver this treatment to patients, and barriers to care and coordination may limit the number of patients with successful outcomes. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'm gonna turn the, the program back to Sandra. Thank you, Dr. Kamanduri. And thank you to Dr. Patel and Dr. Hidalgo, great presentations. Um, well, we have here are some questions for, for you. Uh, the first one, can Dr. Kamanduri talk about what has been the learnings on what not to do when building a cell therapy capacity in a hospital where it does not exist? Yeah, I think um, uh, it's a, obviously a, a great question, a complex question, because um, I think we're still learning. Uh, as, uh, as many of you know, when uh, CAR T-cell programs were rolled out, when individual products were rolled out, typically 20 to 30 centers started uh, dispensing each product. Uh, and um, one of the things I think that has been difficult is uh, as each product has rolled out, and especially in, in the very beginning, we had to effectively reinvent the wheel each time. Uh, and what we have learned, fortunately, is that there are, um, I think, common lessons uh, from, for example, one CAR T cell product from, a, a, you know, it can be a CAR T cell product targeting CD19 from one manufacturer to the next. A lot of these processes are common and yet unique um, regulatory or other uh, interactions uh, are, are necessary to deliver each product. So we're working on ways of streamlining this and leveraging what we have learned from our common experiences. So obviously I think uh, we need to get to the point where uh, when we are rolling out our seventh or eighth uh, approved product at a center, that we're not using uh, unique and redundant uh, approaches uh, for each of these products. So in fact, one of the, the initiatives that I'm, I'm proud to be part of right now is a product that, uh, I mean, a program that is, that is, uh, is, is being facilitate, is facilitated by the National Merit uh, Donor Program and the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy, uh, something that we're calling the 80-20 project so that uh, as new products roll out, perhaps uh, a, a bulk of the, the efforts required can actually be common from um, one product to the other so that that will create less uh, redundancy and decrease the effort required both in the developer side and, and the clinical side. The last thing I'll say is that, that despite our the amazing successes that we've seen clinically, and I alluded to this, um, as I talked about uh, in, in the latter portion of the talk, we know that the process from uh, the initial diagnosis often at a referring provider uh, uh, to referral through the center to get approvals and, uh, and move the patient through is not as fast as what it should be. Uh, and I think that uh, that is despite the fact that we're dealing with physicians, for example, lymphoma physicians or myeloma physicians uh, who we have traditionally worked with. 
Uh, so I think that we're learning from that and we wanna make sure that we don't repeat those mistakes uh, and indeed uh, address the unique issues of uh, as we develop increasingly successful T cell therapies and other therapies for solid tumors to reach out to colleagues that we may not be routinely interacting with. Uh, uh, Dr. Patel and I worked together at the MD Anderson Cancer Center for uh, a long time, but we didn't interact as closely as, as many of my colleagues, for example, in leukemia or, or lymphoma did. Uh, and so we have to build those bridges. Uh, and I think it's part of uh, what you're accomplishing tonight. Uh, and it's part of what we need to do is to make sure we don't um, repeat those mistakes that lead to delays uh, and lead to uh, inadequate access or utilization. Dr. Patel, anything to add to that? No, oh, I, I, I think Dr. Komandori made the appropriate point. I think crosstalk is going to be important. And I think along the same theme, especially for the patient population that we're talking about tonight in synovial sarcoma, identifying the high-risk patients who are likely to require this therapy early and get the process moving can be quite helpful, right? That'll get us through the initial hurdles of at least the first couple of steps to establish whether or not the TCR-based therapy is appropriate or not for the patient. And then comes the crosstalk between disciplines and within the programs at the institution to be prepared as best as we can. So I think Dr. Commandori made some very good points that we will have to sort of keep in mind and make sure we don't repeat some of the same, uh, you know, we don't learn those same lessons the hard way, if you will. Andrew, I'll just add that I think, uh, you know, what Dr. Patel and I both are saying is that early referral, whenever there are multiple treatment options for a patient, as often, or, you know, is the case, sometimes somebody may refer for a specific therapy and our, our appropriate role is to tell them that this is not the best therapy, that perhaps what what uh, they were doing before, or perhaps even nothing is needed. Uh, and that early referral, uh, and, and then uh, that facilitates a discussion between uh, you know, the, the cell therapy center and the patient and their, uh, you know, their primary or referring oncologist. I think that that dialogue is critical. And, and, and I think uh, Dr. Patel used the word cr crosstalk and, and, and that's, that's really critical, it's essential. And if I can add to that point for a second, Sandra, uh, you know, we are all programmed in oncology to plan for success, right? If we were planning for failure, it would be very hard for us to get up in the morning every day and go to work. So intuitively we plan for success, but in many ways, I think we have to educate the population uh, and accept the fact that in some ways we may have to sort of plan for failure. That is be prepared for the failure so that if failure happens and failure of the first line of therapy here, uh, then we are prepared to jump right into the second line and beyond therapy as quickly as we can. That may not come as intuitively as we would like, but that's the part that we are going to need to educate the folks that this is not another off the shelf therapy yet. And that may lead to the follow up discussion. I mean, I think I'd be interested in Krishna's uh, comments about what does he think about off the shelf therapy based on his much broader experience than I have. But back to the point, I think, you know, mentally, we just have to be realistic and pick out the patients who may well need this therapy and be prepared proactively, rather than just being reactive as, as we typically tend to be. Well, that brings us another good question and is, do patients with advanced disease really have the time to wait for adoptive therapy infusion, given the number of steps that must be completed before treatment is administered? So again, it's a heterogeneous population. I think as everyone uh, in the audience who has experience with this disease recognizes that you know, tumors don't read the book and they don't always follow the highway speeds as people don't as they drive on, on, on the freeways. Uh, I think a fair assessment in my opinion is that there is always gonna be one out of four patients in whom the disease is moving at a galloping pace where we don't have the luxury of waiting one month, two months, three months, whatever it takes for the cells to be ready to be infused. Uh, 
I think this ties into our previous conversation though, that if we are prepared ahead of time, know the HLA type, know the level of expression of the cancer testis antigen, then there are things that we can do to sort of bridge the gap, right? I think the second line therapies typically will not be very effective, but they can certainly help us by the six weeks to 12 weeks time frame that the patient may require. And again, this gets back to the thought process we were discussing earlier, that we just will have to sort of plan for failure and be prepared for that failure to hit us in the face rather than wait for the failure to hit us in the face and then react to it. So as long as there is some preparation ahead of time, there has been uh, engagement of the different partners who would be necessary to administer this kind of therapy, like the stem cell therapy group at individual institutions, uh, then in, I, would, uh, I would say that in almost 75 plus percent of patients, we should be able to at least tide the patient over until this therapy becomes available. Yeah, Thank all you, great man. points. I would, add, I would add a couple of things to that. Uh, one, um, you know, although we'll have to see the data and, and we're not obviously at the, at the point where, you know, we have sufficient data that, that we're at the stage of approval, we were fortunate to see in the setting of, of uh, lymphoma uh, and, and also myeloma that highly refractory patients, even with relatively advanced stages of disease could benefit and even be cured, right? Uh, and again, uh, that may not be the case for all T-cell therapies and may not be the case for all, all tumors, but, but we know that, that unlike with other prior therapies, sometimes that, that more advanced patients can benefit. And, 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 and absolutely, as, as Dr. Patel just said, um, you know, we, we have many of the, the original trials in, in the setting of lymphoma for, of, of, of CAR T cells for lymphoma did not allow any bridging therapies. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, when we looked at the use of bridging therapies that, that basically were not designed to have any curative intent, but really to kind of just be a placeholder and, and keep the patients uh, doing well enough that they could tolerate the T cell therapy or, or allow manufacturing to happen, that when you looked at data sets, you know, of individuals who did or did not get bridging therapy, that, that patients who get bridging therapy for lymphoma actually do quite as well. So we're gonna to have to see, obviously, each disease as, a, as you know, we just talked about is going to be different. It may not be you know, that, that uh, patients who are bridged and you know, I'm kind of held in check do as well uh, in this setting, uh, but, but it's possible. So I think you know, all of those questions are gonna be answered in the context of good clinical trials. And, and to some extent, it's likely that after approval, if they occur, that, that we'll see a broader use than typically uh, what happens in clinical trials, and and, and that will, um, you know, that will tell us about how these practice patterns and, and and the varying pace of disease or the varying approaches used prior to uh, you know a T cell therapy will affect the outcomes. And I think that we're going to have to do that. But again, I, I think as uh, we keep coming back to the same point that 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 requires early communication, early referral, and the patient, you know, uh, should have autonomy and an understanding. And help participate in that process, you know, of, of what makes sense for them, uh, and you know, in an environment where probably for years we're still going to be learning. Uh, uh, you know, these are not areas where we um, know everything, and 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 uh, and sarcomas are, are rare diseases, even relative to other rare diseases that we're used to treating with immunologic uh, malignancy therapies like transplant. So we think it's going to be even more critical to have that crosstalk between experts. I think one important point, if I may emphasize, I, I think is to sort of uh, put to rest maybe a very strong phrase, like Krishna said, I think we need some more data, more data specific to the tumor type and so on and so forth. But the myth or the misconception that this may only work for small volume disease or slow growing disease, uh, it's reassuring to me that those who have experience with this have seen this uh, benefit patients with bulky diseases, right? So I, I think the volume of disease as one of the uh, determining factors may not be such a deal breaker, if you will, as long as we're not waiting another three months before we can do something, right? So I, I think uh, there are lots of things that we will learn more as the experience in the specific tumor type becomes more robust and is more extensive. 
Uh, but I think the early hints from, from our hematology colleagues is clear. I mean, to me, I think I'm encouraged by it. Back to you, Sandra. Perfect. Um, well, how, uh, regarding the HLA, how frequent is the typing of HLA in patients with sarcoma? So typically we have not had a reason to do it. Uh, you know, I think it gets back to this thing. There are lots of tests out there that may have some relevance, but who's going to pay for it? Why do we need to do it? I think are all very legitimate questions. Uh, and I mean, we still keep asking some of those same questions for NGS and WGS and whole genome sequencing and stuff, right? Uh, I, I, I think we now have proof of principle data from some early uh, clinical trials that 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 practice in specific subsets probably needs to start percolating into the standard of care, right? And this is where education is going to be very helpful. Uh, granted that, that uh, would, it would be a lot easier to convince providers and institutions to routinely start doing HLA typing and testing for the cancer testis antigens for synovial and myxoid round cell liposarcoma at the first uh, interaction with the treating team. Uh, but I think as the data from the clinical trials that we briefly mentioned, and they will be presented at this meeting a little later uh, in the course, uh, as the data matures and as the data looks more promising, I think that should be good enough reason to sort of at least implement the processes that would then prevent unnecessary, de de unnecessary delays. Perfect, Dr. Bertel. How frequent is the downregulation of HLA in sarcomas and specifically in synovial sarcoma? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think I may tap into Dr. Hidalgo to see if he has any idea from the immunologist's perspective. I think from the practicing clinician standpoint, I think I come back to the statement I made earlier that I just don't think we have tested a large enough sample of people at the right times to be able to answer the question. But that may be one of those things that we just need to proactively start doing it now if we haven't already started. Dr. Hidalgo, do you have any comments? So I, I absolutely agree, Dr. Patel. Um, we really don't know very much uh, about the specific downregulation in, in this type of cancer. Um, but my guess would be that, you know, given that uh, we can find um, oncoantigens that can be presented um, as peptides on the HLA molecules, um, this type of cancer to be successful would have to have some type, uh, some degree of uh, class one downregulation to, uh, to really be able to progress. But certainly we need more studies uh, to, to be initiated to really answer that question. Yeah, based on what we know from hematologic malignancies uh, and, and other tumor types, I think, you know, class one expression is, is pretty ubiquitous on, on human cells, right? So it, I think it's less likely that we'll see class one regulation more often. We see heterogeneity in uh, target antigen expression. Uh, um, one of my colleagues, for example, Jay Spiegel, who just joined us from Stanford, has looked in the context of, of CD19 uh, CAR T cell therapy that not only the frequency of cells expressing CD19, but the degree of CD19 on the surface can uh, be a marker of, of resistance to T cell therapies. So, well, it's certainly possible that HLA uh, class one expression could be downregulated and that would be a problem. Uh, I think it's more likely uh, and more likely to be a problem that the target uh, protein uh, expression uh, or you know expression of sufficient targets on the surface uh, might be a bigger issue, you know, or, or that you have heterogeneity within the cancer uh, such that you have really multiple subclones uh, and that some are more amenable to elimination than others. I think that, uh, but, but as, as uh, you noted, uh, you know, we're gonna, it's gonna take a lot of good uh, uh, immunology and characterization and, you know, we're, we are um, learning more, you know, at, at the single cell level, uh, both about the immune system and, and individual tumors. Now, here comes one question, a very, very nice question. How and when should patients become involved in the decision to use adopted T-cell therapy? 
So I can start off. Uh, I, I, I think we've sort of been talking about this in concept uh, throughout this discussion, right? So from my point of view, uh, I think we know the prognostic factors for this disease. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of how the patient's going to do as they are going through their first line standard of care systemic chemotherapy. Uh, so I personally would sort of start thinking about uh, this, again, as we've talked about before, planning for failure when in fact we all always want to plan for success. But I would start planning for this while they're going through their frontline doxorubicin ifosfamide-based therapy. Somebody who has a uh, 20 centimeter tumor, even if it is localized, I think they are at high risk for, for recurrence. Uh, somebody who has obvious metastatic disease to lungs, I think is going to be another group of patients. So patients with high risk stage three and four disease, where the probability of, of failure of the frontline therapy is not trivial. Uh, I would start thinking and planning for this. Uh, I'm hoping and assuming that once we iron out some of the kinks, I think the preparation will not be so exorbitantly expensive or cumbersome or time consuming that that won't be a reason for the powers to be to say, oh, you can't do this because you don't know that this patient's going to need this therapy, right? So I, I think preparation that we need to do probably should start early. Dr. Komandori, do you have any comment suggestions? No, I completely agree. I, I think right now, we, first of all, we're, we're not talking about approved products. So we're talking about clinical trials. Um, uh, uh, we were talking, uh, you know, be before the session that, um, you know, sarcoma is, uh, these are rare diseases uh, and, and tend to be uh, treated by a highly concentrated group of specialists who understand, uh, you know, the complexities of, of staging and diagnosis and prognosis that are needed really to, to evaluate uh, you know, a broad number of treatment options. This is even more than for the acute leukemias or uh, rare lymphomas that we deal with. These are, these are diseases where it's really critical for patients to be seen uh, 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 at uh, you know, an academic uh, center or, or a high volume center where they can really uh, understand what the diagnosis is. And obviously when we're talking about tumor uh, antigen expression, you know, these are critical things. Um, you know, HLA typing, as Dr. Hidalgo told us, is really not hard, uh, and it can be done anywhere quite quickly. We have to do it for all of our allergenic transplant recipients, and it's just something that has to be done. Uh, assessment of, of target tumors is, is uh, antigens is a little bit harder, uh, but again, can be done. So I think early referral, early consideration of options. Right now, obviously, it requires patients to be on a clinical trial, but even later, I think the consideration of whether uh, traditional uh, chemotherapy and in some cases for sarcoma, obviously hormonal therapies are even uh, effective, uh, you know, whether uh, surgical or, or adjuvant chemotherapy options or uh, immunotherapy options. These are all uh, things that we can't expect every uh, patient to know. And, and, and in fact, you know, often even as uh, I deal with complex issues, uh, I, I'm never, uh, I never cease to be humbled by the complexity of disease. And I'm often reaching out to colleagues for advice. So so I think really early referral, uh, and, and of course, you know, the key thing is the patient, uh, a partner in this, uh, you know, the, the, the and benefits of therapy, likelihood of success, uh, you know, are all dependent on, on a number of things. Over time, we will know more about how patients own uh, likelihood of responding uh, to this therapy versus other therapies uh, will grow, uh, but, but there will always have to be a dialogue. And, and for, for, for us, it will be the critical dialogue between the sarcoma doc and, and, and the patient themselves who have to look at the options and look at, at, at you know, the risk uh, uh, tolerance and, and the desires of the patient. And then we will obviously then be, be uh, you know, brought into the conversation and, uh, and then there'll be a three-way dialogue. So I think that that's critical and, and um, can't emphasize as many times as we have uh, that, 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 uh, you know, that, that conversation uh, is really critical. And the other element to that will be also on the shoulders of those of us who work at referral centers to sort of educate our referral base, right? So I, I, I think we will need to sort of reach out to each one of our constituencies, if you will, to educate them about the availability of yet another option that specifically requires some pre-planning, right? That's the message 
that will have to get out there. But again, that has to get out at the right time. I think, right, like Dr. Commandori said, we're still just working on clinical trials. It's clearly premature at this stage, but that planning needs to start happening so that once there is approval, you just get those wheels in motion rather than having to plan those things out at that time. Yeah, it's, and that's really critical to emphasize that this is hopeful, right? The fact that we have advanced diseases that have often failed multiple therapies and have a treatment option, whether uh, again, um, whether there's a meaningful response or even potentially a cure, uh, forces individuals who may have thought of certain diagnoses or certain stages of diagnosis as a death sentence to rethink that process uh, and refer where they may not have had a reason to refer because it really would have been a confirmation of a palliative course. I can tell you that there are patients, and we don't know whether the same thing will be true for TCR transgenic therapy, where we may have not done an allogeneic transplant over the age of 75 or an autologous transplant over the age of 75, but, but, um, but we know that there are 80 year old individuals who will tolerate a CAR T therapy. It's still risk, you know, there's still real risks involved uh, and real risk of even, uh, you know, morbidity or mortality. Um, but you can imagine that there are referring docs who might say, well, this is a 78 year old patient and cell therapy is not an option. When myeloma was confined to 65 year olds, uh, you know, I, we saw, and we still sometimes see an individual who's 70 who is, you know, wouldn't even blink at doing an auto transplant for myeloma, where a referring doc has told them, well, you're too old uh, and there's no reason for a referral. So, so I do think we, we need to lay the groundwork and, and do broad education, um, not necessarily about what therapy should be offered to the patient, but what the criteria are for referral, just for a discussion to happen. And I think Dr. Patel and I are very happy often to answer an email or pick up the phone and say, yeah, you know, you should refer the patient to us or no, we don't have anything quite there yet. And, and a quick curbside or, or conversation with a referral center um, can be very, very helpful. And, and you know, so that's, a, that's something that the patient or a referring doc uh, can do quite easily to, to really assess whether uh, you know, the, uh, options are, are, are present and possible. And then this is a young population, right? These are tech savvy folks who will be sort of tuned in to the new developments and stuff like that. Uh, so I think once the timing is right, once we have proven this beyond any shadow of doubt and have regulatory approval and stuff, there may well be mechanisms through patient advocacy groups and other sources to just go straight to the patients and educate them. I mean, I think this is a population that's going to be very savvy. That's far more active on Twitter than I ever will be kind of thing. So I, I think there are ways to reach out to all important constituencies so that the end result is that we have helped every or most patients that we could have potentially helped. Well, you, you bring a very important point. I want to, to ask one last question, but I feel that it's very, very good for, at, this, at this point. Without a doubt, CAR T's are expensive. How have insurance companies responded to the CAR T cell availability? Uh, let me let me address this because I'm working a lot in that financial and advocacy space. Um, the vast majority of payers, and certainly all the major payers, recognize uh, uh, that CAR T cells are the appropriate therapy for patients who meet FDA criteria. We have not seen, and I don't expect that we will see, given the cost of these products off-label use of CAR T cells. Uh, so, it, you know, but the, but the FDA labels have been relatively broad, broader than the clinical trial criteria that led to their approval. Now that said, we have increasing heterogeneity. Uh, many have said we don't have a healthcare system at all. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, I have an, a card in my wallet that says Aetna on it, but the reality is my insurer is really my university, the University of Miami is a self-insured plan that pays for the healthcare costs of its employees. And Aetna is really managing uh, a, an employer-based plan, right? So, so that means that the University of Miami uh, uh, might have a different set of criteria for what they allow and what they consider appropriate than another uh, employer, large or small, that also uses Aetna. So that Aetna card doesn't mean what it did in the 1980s, where probably everybody who had a set of Aetna benefits had exactly the same benefits. So we have increasing heterogeneity um, and complexity of the healthcare system. Um, obviously, some of this is dictated by age or finances or Medicaid expansion um, and, and, and payer diversity. 
Um, uh, and, and so, you know, these are really critical. And, and I think that it, it is one of the unfortunate things is in cell therapy is we spend a ton of time actually waiting uh, often for, um, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a dialogue to happen between our financial advocates, uh, payer representatives, and, and, and it can take time. So, so that's the other reason that, again, you know, if there's one lesson that we keep hammering home, you know, the early conversation is important. Um, and, and again, sometimes getting those approvals or, or the, the referral process is, is there. So, so I would say right now to, to simplify the answer, um, we typically don't see refusals of therapy when the therapy is appropriate, but we often see delays. Uh, and we're, I and many others are working on, on streamlining those delays and, and doing advocacy at the congressional and Medicare and, and payer level. Uh, and, and it's getting better. So I, I would hope that by the time we have approved TCR transgenic therapies for solid tumors, uh, we will have solved some of this and, and, and more of that highway will be built. Definitely. I think a lot of work needs to be done for now and then. Well, this, is, this will be all for today. Thank you, Dr. Patel, Dr. Kamanduri, and Dr. Hidalgo. And thank you all for attending our symposia tonight. We look forward to see you face to face next time.